Hi, my name is John Maxwell and I'm your friend. Thanks for joining me today because I'm excited to share with you about my book, The 16 Undeniable Laws of Communication. Now, obviously we can't do 16 laws, but I picked out four, four that I think will be very helpful to you because I'm very aware that Warren Buffett is right when he said that if you can develop the skill of communication, you will help your self-worth and self-value in any area of work that you're in more than any other skill. In other words, he said it's the number one skill to develop. And for the next hour, we're going to work on helping you develop that skill by sharing with you four of those laws. One of those laws is the law of visual expression, which just basically says show and tell is better than just tell. Because it's one thing for me to teach you about communication, but it's also wonderful that because my team has assembled together clips that will show you communicating from the things that I'm teaching you. And it's so much better to not only hear it, but also to see it. So, hey, we're going to laugh together. We're going to learn a lot together. Trust me, it's going to be a wonderful hour that we spend just learning how to communicate. And why is this so important to me? If you could do one thing and do it well, it's learning how to communicate. And that's what I'm all excited about, teaching you how to do that. Now, before I'm done, and, and by the way, one of my laws is the law of anticipation. I'm building it right now. Before I'm done, I'm going to share with you four easy ways for you to learn how to be a better communicator. And why am I doing that? Because I am here for you. This hour is about you. It's all about you learning these laws so that you can communicate better and be much more effective in whatever work that you're doing. So I'm very excited about it. Uh, I think you're ready to get started. I know I am too. And the first law we're going to talk about is the law of connection. And the reason that we're talking about the law of connection is because honestly, that's the key to the entire book. Because the law of connection lets us know that speaking, communicating is all about others. Now, <laughs> you're seeing me uh, standing here in this empty auditorium. And uh, I know when you think of communication, you think I'm going to be on stage because that's where communicators stand or sit. But, but I don't really start my communication on stage. I really started here in the auditorium. Because what I need to do as an effective communicator is I need to think not as a speaker, but as a listener. Not as someone who's on stage, but someone who is sitting in these empty pews. And may I say this? If you know how to connect with people, then the pews, the seats that you have, will be filled with people that are going to learn and grow. But if I can't connect, honestly, I might as well have empty seats in the auditorium because nobody is going to be listening and nobody is going to be learning. So I start here. I sit in these seats because I'm wanting to feel what the audience is going to feel when they walk in. I begin to put my mind not on the stage, but out where the seats are. I was speaking in Canton, Ohio a few years ago. This is very interesting. And I was in the green room and there were two other speakers and, and they had been, the conference had been going on for a few hours. And one of the speakers came up to me and said, John, you're going to speak in five minutes. What are you thinking about? And I looked at him and I said, well, I'm thinking about the audience. And he was very surprised. He said, I thought you'd be thinking about your talk. I said, no, I, I, I know what I'm going to say. It's, it's not an issue of content. It's an issue of connection. How do I connect with the audience? So I literally, I sit here in an empty, in an empty auditorium before I ever speak. And I put myself in the heart and the mindset of the audience because I know if I'm thinking about them, I'll connect with them. When I graduated from college, my dad gave me some great advice. He said, John, if you want to be successful in life, you need to believe in people, you need to value people, and you need to unconditionally love them. And that's what I've done all my life. When I speak, I look at the auditorium, I look at, I look at the people, I look into their eyes, and I'm saying to them visually, 
I value you. I believe in you. I unconditionally love you. And as they are in their seats, they receive that message. They begin to feel it. They begin to sense it, which is the first start of connecting and really helping people. Just unconditional love. So people say, John, what's the key to connecting? <laughs> okay. I told you my name is John. I'm your friend. I'm going to give you the key right now. It's so simple. You're going to get it immediately, but it's so hard. It may take you like it did me eight years to practice it and get it good. You see, the key to connecting is you have to get over yourself. Because this is not about me. This is about you. This is about the audience. And when I get over myself, then I can give myself to you. As long as I'm thinking about me and my speech and am I doing a good job and do the people like me and, and are, are they understanding what I'm saying? As long as it's about me, I won't connect with you. It's impossible for me to think about me and connect with you at the same time. So it is all about you. So I, I sit in an empty auditorium, but I know that soon this auditorium will be filled with people. They're going to come in and they're going to sit down in these seats and I will then go to the stage because that's what communicators do. They, they do get to the stage, but they don't start at the stage. They start right here in the auditorium, in these seats, putting themselves where the people are. In fact, they're coming in now. Just come on in. I'm so glad to see all of you. Make yourself at home and grab a seat. And, and by the way, this is very important. If you can get over yourself, I can now give myself to the people that are sitting here. But, but if you don't connect with people, honestly, it's like winking at a girl in the dark. Huh. Nothing happens. You, you don't want to do that. When you speak, you want something to happen. So now as they come in and, and, and are going to listen to me, hi, good to see you. I'm glad you came. You see, there, there's a question. There's a question I have to ask myself. And the question is, do I want you to be fans of mine or do you want to be friends of mine? You see, that's the question I have to ask because if I want fans, I will speak and separate myself from the audience because I want them to be impressed with me. I want them to say, oh my gosh, Maxwell is amazing. He's so good. Oh yes, I'm so glad I'm hearing him. But it's not about me, it's about you. So how do I turn fans into friends? It's very simple. I close the gap. And so I'm not wanting you to be amazed at how John Maxwell communicates. I want you to be amazed by the fact that what I say, you can apply to your life. That when you walk out, you're not going to say, boy, John is amazing. What you're going to say is, I think I could be amazing. You're going to begin to focus on you and by focusing on you, you're going to improve your life. And by the way, that's what a communicator wants for the audience. So when I speak, I start connecting with my audience immediately. Uh, let me show you what I'm talking about. My name is John. My name's John. I'm your friend. My name's John. <laughs> and I'm your friend. My name is John. I'm your friend. What's your name? Nice to meet you. <laughs> On the count of three, give me your name. One, two, three. Yeah! Nice to meet you. Can you guys backstage do me a favor? If you've got a stool, I'd love to have, bring out a bar stool. I'd like to sit down and talk with people. Can you hang with me for uh, four sessions? Look at your neighbor and say, don't miss this. Look at your neighbor and say, you're about to understand life. Just look at your neighbor and say, transformation is possible. Look at your neighbor and, and tell them, you're, I'm learning something. So look at the person beside you and say to them, you can become a better communicator. If, if I could just literally come off the stage and, 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 and I could get real close to you and we could have kind of like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Oh, thank you. I love this. I, she just put her tablet in front of the timer. Let me explain something to you. She knows how to read the room. <laughs> how many of you would like to improve your communicating skills? Let's see that hand, okay? So, look, everybody has got their hands raised. I'm going to talk to you in a moment about connecting. And when I saw the guys with the red tennis shoes, I said, 
I have got to have some. My name is John, and I'm your friend. <laughs> if you want to become a great communicator, you need to focus on the people in the audience. In other words, it's not about you. It's, it's, it's not about me as the speaker. It's about the audience. And I have to get over myself. You're going to have to get over yourself. If you get the book, you're going to learn a lot more about the law of connection because it is so essential for your success as a communicator. Now, the second law that I'm going to share with you is the law of visual expression. In other words, show and tell is better than tell, okay? I have really taken time in my communication process to learn this law. And, and let me tell you why. I started off um, standing behind a, a large podium. And, and to be honest with you, it was so big that I, if all they could see was from the neck up. Honestly, if I didn't have any clothes, they would never even know it because I, I'm just, I could just been, yeah, butt naked. You understand? Because all they could see was the head. And, and I began to learn that that's not a good way to effectively communicate with people. So I, I, I advanced slowly. I went to a smaller podium. And then one day I, you know, I just started, I stood up and I started walking around and, 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 and connecting and talking with the audience. You see, body movements, uh, gestures that I do, uh, my facial expressions, all of those things are extremely important in connecting with people. Now, the reason I've said often already in our teaching that you have to get over yourself so that you can give yourself the audience is that when it's not about me as the speaker, I'm going to have freedom to be very expressive. Now, the moment that I think it's about me, then I'm going to be saying, well, I wonder if they'll like this expression. I, I wonder if, if this will, if this will please them. But you become very uh, free. Well, you can get over yourself. And I have a video that I want you to see that has been seen by millions of people uh, of me speaking when the music stand just went bad. And uh, I wasn't prepared for it. The people weren't prepared for it. But we had a blast. You, you watch this. I hate bologna sandwiches. And the guy beside me says... <laughs> heal, heal. I hate cheap music stands. <laughs> Especially when they interrupt my story. I'm right in the middle of a great story. Look at this, Todd. Could, could you talk to your dad about this? I mean, we just... Oh, give me my, give me the rubber band. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, am I getting the story now? Oh. You gotta get something you can depend on. There's a backup. Thank you.
The message is on attitude. And I'm doing my best. I'm just doing my best. Okay, well, I, I hope the music stand really never happens to you. But if it does, if you've gotten over yourself, you can enjoy yourself. And here's what I know. If it's about me, when something goes wrong, the audience becomes a little bit embarrassed for me. But if I'm enjoying myself and it's not about me, then everyone else can enjoy the experience, even if it's going south. But another way for visual expression uh, it is through word pictures. I can remember being with my friend Chris Stevens, and we were celebrating an anniversary of his leadership. And uh, we, there's a huge crowd, thousands of people that night. But during the day, we played golf. Chris is a good golfer. I'm a good golfer. Uh, Chris, on the third hole, hit a ball about this far from the hole. And, and in fact, I said, lay down beside the ball and have your putter there. And I took a picture of, him lay, picture of him laying there by the green with the hole there real close. And it just kind of showed that Chris made a very good shot. When I went to speak that night, I brought two pictures. And I gave it to the crew. I said, I want you, when I speak, to show these pictures when I ask for them. The first picture is Chris with the, the, the ball about that close to the hole. And I looked at the audience and I said, Chris Stevens, your leader is a fabulous golfer. Look at that picture. That's how good a golfer he is. He's amazing. Now, the second picture was from the 18th hole where I had shot and I hit the ball that close to the hole. <laughs> now, I've just got done saying that Chris is an amazing golfer. Are you with me? This is the law of visual expression. This is how it works. Uh, you know, show and tell is just better than tell. So after I've bragged on Chris with his putt about that close, I said, oh, and, and this was, this was my shot. And they showed it with it real, I never said a word. <laughs> I never said, the crowd just erupted in laughter. You see, again, the power of visual communication is just absolutely huge. I can remember one other quick story. Uh, several years ago when Robert Schuler was still pastor of the Crystal Cathedral, uh, you have to go back really about 20, 25 years ago when the, when the large video screens started to appear in, in auditoriums. And, and, and I had never spoken with a large video screen. I, I was, I was used to this kind of eye to eye connection where people would watch me. And so when I got up to speak, this really caught me by surprise because the video screen wasn't like behind me. It was about 35, 40 yards to my left. And so when I got up to speak, the people weren't looking at me. They were looking over at the screen. And it unnerved me. I thought, oh my gosh, what are they doing? They're, they're looking. And, and for my first impulse was get up, run over <laughs> to where the screen is and stand beneath the screen. And, and, and now you're kind of looking at me. But of course, I couldn't, I couldn't get over there. And, and so now I'm sitting here. They're looking over there. And guess what happened? I made a funny, just a funny expression, and the place erupted in laughter. And immediately I realized, they're seeing me. They're visually seeing me. In fact, they're visually seeing me better than they've ever seen me before, because now my face is not the side, my face is like four before, you know what I'm saying? It's been, and, and, and again, it's just the power of what visual expression will do in speaking. Uh, he, how about if I just take a moment and I show you some examples of some of my visual expressions that <laughs> you'll, you'll laugh a little bit when you see these. They understand, they understand that effectiveness in leadership and effectiveness in communication is based on similarity, not differences. When you have a tough call, gang, here's the way this works. Everything worthwhile is uphill, and if everything is worthwhile is uphill, we have to be intentional to go uphill. When you make the tough call, tough calls equal a breakthrough. If I'm a four as a leader, the people I attract to me will basically be threes, twos, and ones. We have a choice as leaders, and that is that we can either let people into our life or we can basically stiff arm people and keep them at a distance. You don't just get out one day and say, oh, I got a real tough call, I don't know, you know, should I relocate the organization or not relocate the organization? Well, let me see, let me get a coin. Heads we relocate, tails we stay, you know. Look at this. I, 
I have no idea. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Here we go. I put it on backwards. <laughs> no. No. Now, let me just say something to you. Don't overthink this, okay? I, I'm not suggesting you need to perform a country song with a cowboy hat for, for the next talk that you do. I, no, no, don't, 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 even, don't even go there. I look, like a, I look like a dwarf myself with that cowboy hat. I know. But I am talking to you about connecting with people and using visual aids to do it. Simon Sinek, who's a great friend of mine, has a video that literally has been watched by over 57 million viewers. And what did he use for his visual? An old fashioned, hey, flip chart. Okay. I mean, you're just, it, it doesn't matter. What I'm saying to you is anytime you have something else beside yourself to use for visual expression, it just allows you to get the message over and connect with the people. So, uh, I would encourage you to try adding a little visual expression to your next talk. And I'll bet you'll be amazed at how your audience responds. Show and tell is better than just tell. And I want to encourage you, if you'll get the 16 Laws of Communication book, you're just going to learn so much more about the law of visual expression. All I'm doing is giving you just a little tipping point of each one of these laws, enough to encourage you to be a better communicator, but also not enough to encourage you to get the book. You really want the 16 Laws of Communication. One of my biggest speaking failures was when I was asked to uh, fill in for another speaker. And, and really all I have to do is give you his name and you're going to, I'll tell you the story. I was asked um, several years ago at a huge convention in Boston, I, I, about 10, 12,000 people. Uh, on the day that the convention was happening, I wasn't one of the scheduled speakers at all. In the morning, late morning, I received a call from the man who was leading the, uh, that convention. And he said, John, our, our featured last speaker is not able to speak today. He's not well physically. And would you catch a plane and run up here and would you fill in for him? And I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to do that. If, if I can, you know, get the flight and we can make this happen. And, and then I said, well, who is it? And he said, Christopher Reeves. Superman. Fat man <laughs> is going to fill in for Superman. So I know I'm already in trouble. I'm I, okay. This is, uh, this is not going to be very easy at all. But so I get up there. And, and so now I'm, and I literally get up there about 15 minutes before I was supposed to speak. And so I'm over the side to stick me with the mics, they're doing everything, getting everything ready. And then I hear, that they're about to go out and announce to the crowd that Christopher Reeves won't be here. <laughs> I had assumed that they had done that earlier. I had assumed that they had prepared the people, that Superman wouldn't be there, but Fat Man is coming. <laughs> they literally went out, announced that Christopher Reeves was not well, he would not be there that day. And before I go out, Hundreds of people start to stand up. They're walking out. I, I mean, they came to see Superman. So as I am walking on the stage, a couple hundred people are, are walking out. Now, there are 10, 12,000 people there, so I still got a great crowd. But there are two, two or 300 people saying, whoops, I, I, I'm out of here. And so then I walk out, and I have the challenge of filling in for Superman. And the first thing I did, I looked at the audience and said, I don't blame you. I'd kind of like to walk off myself. <laughs> and immediately they did what you did. They laughed and they gave me a chance. And I filled in as best I could for Superman. Now, the reason I'm saying and giving you that story is because um, I hear speakers all the time. They'll talk about, well, that was a good crowd or, or that was a tough crowd. Or I, I, I always hear them talk about it was a good crowd, tough crowd. I, it's not about a good crowd, tough crowd. It's all about you as a communicator. In other words, in the law of anticipation, you want to set the table in such a way that your people anticipate what you're about to say to them. And this is absolutely huge. And so 
When I walked out with Christopher Reeves not being there, I let him know I was, you know, I was as disappointed as they were, and I kind of wanted to walk off the stage, and immediately they began to connect with me. And then I began to build anticipation, and I said, although I can't teach you how to fly, I will teach you how to soar to success. Mm. Mm. Come on, talk to me. Hmm? And, and, and then we started soaring to success. But you see, I had to connect with them. I could have walked out there, act like nothing was happening. When everybody in the auditorium says, a lot of stuff's happening. People are leaving. I watch communicators many times not watch the crowd. And therefore, they miss their leadership speaking communication uh, cues that would help them to be effective. So let's talk about how do I as a leader create anticipation? What I do is I, I think of this as kind of like setting the table. And I'm, I'm getting ready to set the table and, and we're about to have a great meal. And, and I kind of want to let you know what's happening. It's kind of like when you're in a restaurant and you say, what's special? I mean, I know you got stuff on the menu and they'll say, well, there are three things here. And, and you really kind of tune in because this is kind of what they're really doing today. And this is maybe something that you really wanted that was on the menu. There's a way as a communicator to begin to help your audience lean forward and anticipate when you're getting ready to speak. And so I, I use phrases like this, and, and this is, these are what I call anticipation phrases. Again, in my book on the laws of communication, I fill the book with these laws, with these practical ways that you can read the law and you can begin to say, oh, I know how to do that because I'm showing you a way. And so let me give you some of my anticipation phrases, okay? And I'll tell you what, you, you kind of judge them, okay? When I give this to you, if it was great, you raise your hand real high. If it was kind of okay, you raise your hand high. And if I didn't build any anticipation, just cross your arms, shake your head, and do and walk out. That, I've been walked out before. It's, it's happened before. For example, I'll say something like this. I woke up early this morning, and I was so filled with anticipation of what I'm about to teach you. Now, what's that do for you? Come on, give me. All right, okay. All right, there are two right here that went halfway up. You get one more chance. <laughs> if you don't lie and raise your hand high, we will be kicking you out of the audience. Just trust me, we're, it's going to happen. Or, or something, I'll say, say, watch this one. How's this for an anticipation phrase? Okay. I'm going to share something with you that I have never shared with anyone else before. Well, that was good. And look, even the doubters got their hands up. Now, it, honestly, you could do better than that because when it's really good, you could put both hands in the air. You understand? I mean, we, I mean, you get involved with me. Okay. Hey, come on. Help me out. <laughs> now, now the doubters are raising their arms before they ever hear. How, how about this? I have created this teaching, this lesson. I've created it just for you. How's that? Huh? Is it that? Is that good? Or, or how? Okay. Well, that, you're doing so good. It took them a little while, but they're getting better. They're just getting better. Uh, or this one, how about this? Look at the person that you're sitting beside right now and say to them, today you're going to learn something. Huh? Huh? Isn't that good? And guess what? Now you're even expressing what I'm wanting to express, and you're already make, you're making it contagious. Or I'll say something about this. Um, I, I'm going to share something with you right now that has life-changing possibilities for you. Doesn't that just kind of fill you up with anticipation? Or uh, how many of you are as excited as I am to get going? Are you ready to go? Huh? Okay, here. Now, okay, I, I've just given you some, not all, of the anticipation phrases that I teach you in this incredible law. I've been setting the table throughout our time together today. I, I'm sure you've noticed, but if not, just watch this. So, hey, we're going to laugh together. We're going to learn a lot together. Trust me, it's going to be a wonderful hour that we spend just learning how to communicate. And now, before I'm done, and, and by the way, one of my laws is the law of anticipation. I'm building it right now. Before I'm done, I'm going to share with you four easy ways for you to learn how to be a better communicator. And the reason that we're talking about the law of connection is because honestly, that's the key to the entire book. Go. This is very interesting. I'm going to give you the key right now. It's so simple, you're going to get it immediately, but it's so hard. 
It may take you like it did me eight years to practice it and get it good. If you get the book, you're going to learn a lot more about the law of connection because it is so essential for your success as a communicator. So uh, I would encourage you to try adding a little visual expression to your next talk. And I'll bet you'll be amazed at how your audience responds. Show and tell is better than just tell. And I want to encourage you, if you'll get the 16 Laws of Communication book, you're just going to learn so much more about the law of visual expression. All I'm doing is giving you just a little tipping point of each one of these laws. Let me talk just a moment longer on anticipation because there's a, a mindset of anticipation which basically says how we view things is how we do things. This is huge. So what I view is what I do. So that's the mindset, but the message mindset, as I'm getting ready to communicate, I just flip that. Because in the message mindset, I look and I, I, say, I say to them that how I do things is how I view things. And so, so many times in communication, the speaker talks about, as I referred a little bit earlier in the clips, about a good audience or a bad audience. It's really not about a good audience and a bad audience. It's not about them bringing the best out of me. It's about me bringing the best out of them. And so I... I don't rely on the audience to make my day. I rely on my communication to make their day. And there's a big difference between will they help me or will I be able to help them? And this began to really change my life as a communicator when I quit looking for good audiences. And I said, why don't you just be a good communicator? A good communicator will take a bad audience and turn them into a good audience. Does that make sense to you? That's, that's just absolutely important. Uh, when I speak to an audience, I always believe the best in the people. Remember my father's advice, you know, believe in people, value people, unconditionally love people. And so I believe in my audience and I believe in my message. And, you know, they asked Frank uh, Lloyd Wright one time, who was the great architect and, and builder of homes, they asked him, uh, what was his greatest masterpiece as far as it, 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 what he had built, what he had, what he had as an architect form. And he, his, his words were so good. He said, my masterpiece is always my next one. And that's how I feel about my talks. Um, in fact, it kind of is a joke with people who know me well, because I get ready to speak and I'll say, this is the best teaching I've ever done. <laughs> This is going to, this is so good. And, and they'll kind of behind the scenes mock it. There comes the best teaching he's ever done, you know. And, and, and let me tell you something. Somebody said, well, is that arrogant? I don't think it's arrogant, but I do think it's anticipating. And let me just say this. If you don't think the talk you're about to give is the best talk you've ever given, why don't you give the audience a break and not give them one? If, if I can't believe in the message I'm teaching and love the message I'm sharing, why would the people ever believe or love or connect with it. So let me just talk to you about your next uh, masterpiece, your next talk that you're going to give. I, I want to share with you uh, four easy ways to maximize the next time you get up and speak in front of an audience. And, and they, these four things I'm going to share with you come out of another one of my laws in the 16 Laws of Communication, and that is the law of content. Um, the law of content just simply says that when you have something worth saying, people will start listening. Wow, that is so true. Now, when I wrote this law, I, I described speaking and preparing speeches and content like putting a puzzle together. And, and I talked about the fact that when you start with the puzzle, you, you put in the first piece, you don't know what, I mean, unless you look at the box top, it, it, it doesn't tell you anything. And you have to put several pieces together before it begins to make sense. I can still remember uh, when I lived in San Diego, I would go to the San Diego Padres baseball games sometimes. And during, between one of the innings, on the, on the big scoreboard back there, they would put one piece of a puzzle of a, of a baseball player's face. And, and everybody knows that they're trying to guess who the player is, but nobody can guess with one piece or two pieces or three pieces. But everybody, I mean, everybody's watching this. And then about four or five pieces, all of a sudden, people start to put out names. Well, in, in speaking, it's the same way. There, there, there are what I call nine pieces to the puzzle of, of your talk. 
Now, I, I, I don't have time to give you all nine, but I, I will give you four of them today. And by the way, why should I give you all nine? You won't buy the book if I give you all of them. Huh? So, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you four of the nine. And the, and the first one is for you to create a runway for your ideas. When I'm getting ready to express a thought or, a, or, or an idea, I, I, I want to give them a runway so that, so that we can really, so that we can really take off and, 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 and we can connect. So uh, it may be a current event, you know. For example, during COVID, every time I would address an audience, and I did most of this virtually, I would talk about the conditions and the circumstances, and and immediately it would relate to where they were because it was a very di- uncomfortable time for people. So I'm I'm taking a current event and I'm putting the talk in that current event, and and everybody says, well, he's right with us. He understands what we're going through. He understands all all the things that we are. Uh, we are, we, we, we are feeling our own life. Uh, sometimes, um, I'll, I'll put out a question. I'll ask a question of the audience. Now, let me just say something about asking questions of the audience. As a speaker, never stand before your audience and ask them a question that they cannot answer. I watch speakers do this all the time. They'll get up and they'll say, okay, uh, how many miles is the moon from the earth? Well, are we astronauts? I mean, hello. And everybody, you know, we don't know how many miles. And then they'll say, well, and then they'll give us the mileage. Now, that's not good communication. That's showing off. What that is, is as a communicator, I'm saying, I know something you don't know. And what I'm doing, instead of having friends and bringing them together, I'm creating fans. I'm separating them. And now all of a sudden I'm setting myself apart. You never want to set yourself apart. So never, I never ask a question of the audience that they don't know the answer because it's all about us. It's not about what I know and what you don't know. I, I saw this, um, I took a, a, a group to uh, last year over to France and we went to Normandy. And it was a, a very moving three-day experience. And we had Doris Kearns Goodwin with us who was a great leadership historian and she's a, she is truly amazing. And, and so we were at a museum at Normandy and we had a guide that spent an hour with us telling us about, uh, uh the, the advancement on the beaches and, and just basically tell us the story. Here's what I want you to catch. Every three minutes he'd stop and he would ask our group a question of which none of them could answer. How many, how many soldiers charged up Omaha Beach? Well, I don't know how many soldiers charged up on Omaha Beach. And then he would, he would say, 7,322. And then he would ask another question. Every three minutes he'd ask a question. And every question he asked, the audience could not answer. Now, I stood back because I knew he was in trouble. Now, brilliant guide, knew the numbers, really could have given us an enjoyable experience. But it's not enjoyable because every three minutes he's going to look at my group and he's going to ask them a question. And when, when he would ask the question, I stood back and I watched this. Don't miss this. He would ask a question they couldn't answer. And my group, as soon as he started to look at a certain section, they'd lower their heads. Of course they're lowering their heads. They'd want him to pick them out because they don't know the answer. It, it reminded me when I went to school. Remember? Come on. Remember when you're in school? Teacher asked you a question you didn't know? Yeah. 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 Pass over me, pass over me. You never want to do that. You want to keep your people together. That's what great communicators do. So I'll sometimes talk about a current event. I'll sometimes talk about maybe a question or, or I'll make a heart connection with them. And, and, and I'll say something like maybe like this. I'll, I'll be talking to them and I'll say, you know, sometimes I just get discouraged and, and I, 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 I want to kind of pull myself out of it. Have you ever had a time when you were discouraged? Well, everybody in the room says, yeah, I've had a time. I mean, the only person that doesn't say that is a person that's on drugs. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we've all had, a, we've all had those discouraging times. What am I doing? I'm talking about a problem I've had or a situation that's been difficult. And I always start with me. Remember this. In connecting with people, you start with you. And when I say I'm discouraged, guess what? I give you permission to say I've been discouraged too. But if I say, you know, I've never been discouraged in my life. It's always been a 10 every day. How do you feel? Well, now you're all going to be liars. You know, that's 10 too. But, but that is, a, you've got to connect with your people. And those are the three ways that I, I do it. Now, there are a lot of other ways to do this also. And, and let me just show you a few of them. I don't have time to talk about them, but you just watch the archives here, the footage, and you can see other ways that you can do this. 
How many of you like to play golf? How many golfers do I have here? Oh, oh you got a lot of golfers. How many of you would like to increase your influence with your boss? Can I see your hand? How many of you would like to increase your influence with your kids? How many of you would like to just have some influence with your kids? How many of you know people that talk but they don't connect? Huh? Come on, raise your hand. You got that, huh? Lao Tzu, who is the Chinese kind of philosopher, said, if we don't change the direction we are headed, we are likely to end up where we're going. So Martin Luther King is doing the great famous speech in the mall, steps of, of course, the Lincoln Memorial. You see the I have a dream part wasn't in his teaching at all. But he's looking at the mall and he's seeing the people and Mahalia Jackson was right behind him. And, and, and there was kind of almost a quietness and awkwardness in the mall and Mahalia Jackson says, tell him about your dream, Martin. Tell him about your dream. And that's when he went into, I have a dream. This uh, lecture has potential to help you to become a better leader, to change your life. And what I'm going to share with you now is life changing. And, and you just don't want to miss this because I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some stuff right now. This is pure gold, okay? This is so good, I hardly want to give it to you. So you better start with yourself. Because if you're leading others and have nothing to give them, then I can promise you, you'll never be what you want to be as a leader. After you create a runway, the second thing I want you to do is I want you to plan your transitions out. Uh, when I talked a little bit a moment ago about the tour guide, you know, there's one cardinal rule for a tour guide. I mean, if you're, if you're, you know, I mean, they always, they have a way to identify themselves, you know, and they've got a sign, follow me. And, and the, the one cardinal rule, if you're a tour guide is don't lose your crowd. <laughs> you, you know, you're not a turn, you know, you're know you're not a good tour guide when you turn around and nobody's there. You know what I mean? And, and it, it's kind of like my favorite leadership expression. He that thinketh he leadeth and hath no one following him is only taking a walk. <laughs> And that's the way it is with tour guides sometimes. And that's the way it is sometimes with communicators. So how do I keep them with me? Now, in the book, I talk about several ways to keep your audience with you. But I want to talk about one right now, and that's what I call the value of the pause. And if you've heard me communicate, you know, I, many times when I talk, I, I have moments where I just stop. And sometimes for three or four seconds. And, and I'll admit, sometimes I'll, I'll pause and I'll walk away and go back to my chair. And, 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 and why, there are reasons why I do that. You know, Mark Twain said, no word was ever as effective as a rightly timed pause. And I know that to be true. And so let me just, this is not all of them, but this is some of them. Let me tell you what a pause can do that will help you to emphasize what you're saying. And in other words, what, what, what does silence do? Sometimes when you're silent, it just underlines something that you have said that's very important. And, and, and if we rush through it, they miss the importance of that moment. A, a, a pause can also, uh, it gives your audience a chance to catch up. Some speakers speak so fast that you, you, you want to say, excuse me, you, you can take a break now. Um, sit down for two minutes. We'd just like to try to assimilate all the things you said because you just, you just said it, you know, you said it so quickly. I, re I remember years ago, Margaret and I were uh, in Germany and I went on the Audubon and I, 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 it was so fun because you can go as fast as you want to. And I like to go fast. And, and, and I had a Mercedes and, and, and it was in kilometers, not miles. And I knew Margaret could not transfer kilometers and miles. And so I just said, honey, when you see this, it's, it's like three times faster than we're really going. And so we're going, yeah, man, I'm just on there going as fast as I can. I'm going 120. They're still passing me. We're having a blast. And finally, Margaret said, you know, John, would you just slow down? She said, we're going through Austria now, and I'd like to see the country. <laughs> I just like this. Sometimes I look at an, a speaker and I say, would you just slow down? But could, could you not pause? Could you not, could you not give people a break to just kind of think about what you've just said, because communications, it's not a race. It's meant to be a, a very enjoyable journey. Another reason that I pause is that um, it brings the audience back to you. You know, so you, you could lose an audience. And when you lose an audience, the quickest way to bring them back to you is not to say anything. Remember when you went to school and the teacher would stop talking? And because you're all, we're all fidgety, moving around, and we'd all finally look at the teacher. And when we all were looking at the teacher, she'd begin again. The, that's the value of the pause. A, a pause could... Uh, a pause can do this really good. It can 
point to what you're about to say. In other words, there are times when I pause and I'm getting ready to, to, to make another statement and I want to give people time to think about what that statement's going to be. If I'm a good communicator, a lot of times they can anticipate what I'm about to say. When you anticipate what I'm about to say because I paused, it takes that what I'm saying and it just doubles the impression on you because you're saying, he thinks like me. That's huge. And, and a pause also, it allows the, it allows the audience, it allows you as a listener to, to hear the whisper. And I think this is a big miss in communication. There are some times when, when you speak, but there's a voice that's higher that wants to speak to you. It, and, and, and you just need to hear the whisper. But if I don't pause, you, you don't get to hear that. Henry Nowen said, silence is an act of war against the competing voices that are within us. That's an incredible statement. And, and so I say, let silence speak for you. Let silence speak above you. Let silence speak beyond you. Let, 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 let silence speak. This is just absolutely huge. Now, let me just say this. When I teach this in communication, this is the hardest thing I can get, try to get communicators to do is pause. And I know why. When I pause for a moment, I give up control. In fact, when I pause, guess what? I let you have control. And many speakers are afraid to let you have control because they, they want to get it back because they want to make sure they take you where you want. And I understand that. So you're going to have to work on this, but I can promise you, you need to give up control. Let people have it for a moment. And when they give it back to you, you will have connected with them. And that's a beautiful thing. Now, number three, I use phrases that have what I call an echo. And this is kind of what I call wordsmithing. So what do you hear me say? I'll say things like, you have to give up to what? Go up. You have to give up to go up. That's a, that's a stick phrase. That, that's sticky. Well, you know, I, I could just say give up and you'd, okay, I'm surrendered. I'm surrendered. Yeah. But if, if you have to give up to go up. And if you don't give up, you don't go up. So if you want to go up, you have to give up. So the next time you want to go up, realize you have to give up before you can go up. And if you don't give up, you don't go up. <laughs> do, you, do you see how it echoes? It just echoes. Hey, what else do I say? Pay now, play later. Pay now, play later. That's what my dad taught us when we were kids growing up. You can either pay now and play later, or you can play now and pay later. But you're going to pay. And he said, if you'll pay now, you don't have compounding interest. He said, if you, if you play first, the longer you wait to pay, the higher the price is going to be. Pay now, play later. If you don't, you can play now and you pay later, but you're always going to pay. So don't think you just get a play, okay? The echoes, echoes, echoes. People don't care how much you know. Oh, that was so good. Oh, let's do it again, okay? I, and I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you repeat it out loud for the, for, for the people, okay? So people don't care how much you know until they... I've taken you all on the road with me. I really am. Now, that has an echo to it. So as a communicator, one of the things you do is you, you look at your words and you just ask yourself, are these words that I say going to be repeated? That's the echo. And if, 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 if you, here's, you, when you say words, you want them to be remembered and repeated. But the greatest way for them to be remembered is for them to be repeated. Because once they're repeated, it sticks more in the mind. Now, okay, so far I've shown you three tips that will help you make your next talk better. So, so I'm, I'm about to land the plane, okay? We're about to land the plane. And I want to share one final tip to you on, on basically how do you land the plane? How, how do I come in and make sure that what I have said has had a huge impression? So I'm going to give you an added bonus. I, I, okay, this is something I'm just going to give it to you because I have to, because it's so important. It's in the book and it's just one of those nuggets. Every time I, every time I wrote one of the laws, because all my life I've communicated and it's a gifted area of my life. When I would write the law, I would spend time going inside and ask myself, why do I do this? And how does this work? Because I wanted to make it clear to you, the reader, each law, how to, how to do this. And, and one of, when I was writing, 
I was thinking about the fact that I always deliver two messages. Now, this is huge, okay? You've never read this anywhere. I promise you, in every law, I put stuff that I've never spoken about, and I don't think that I've ever been spoken about in how to connect with people and communicate with them. And here's what I discovered, that when I give a message, when I'm teaching like this, I give two messages at the same time. I give my best message and I give what I call the big message. The best message is what I'm teaching right now. I'm teaching four laws of communication I, and I'm doing my best. I call it my best message because I've given it to you now and, and that changes from time to time. Today I'm doing the four laws, today I'll do another talk. Okay, you with me? The best message changes, but the big message never changes. The big message is always the same message, and it's who I am as a person and a communicator. It's my DNA of communication. Do not miss this. I'm going to give it to you right now because we're landing the plane. I, I'm bringing it home for you right now. So when I'm talking to any audience at any time, there are four questions I ask myself that determine my big message. And these are the four questions you need to ask yourself also. Question number one is what do I want them to, uh, what do I want them to see? The second question is what do I want them to know? The third question is what do I want them to feel? And the fourth question is what do I want them to do? Now, I'm going to give you the answers for me, but these answers I give you are my DNA as a communicator. They won't have to be the same for you at all. You with me? But you have to ask yourself the question. So what do I, what do I want you to see? I want you to see your possibilities. I am a possibility communicator. Whenever you hear Maxwell talk, he's going to help you reach high, sky's the limit. Possibilities are all over my talk. Every talk has possibilities in it. So what do I want you to know? I want you to know that I value you. You'll always feel valued when I talk. You'll always feel, man, he cares for me. He believes in me. He unconditionally loves me. He values me. I want you, I want you to know that. I want you to see your possibilities. I want you to know that I value. What do I want you to feel? Empowered. I want you to feel when I teach that what I'm teaching you, you can go do. I, I want you to walk out of the room and not say, John's amazing. I want you to walk out of the room and say, I'm amazing. I, I want you to walk out of the room and say, John can do this. I want you to walk out of the room and say, I can do this. I want you to feel empowered. And what do I want you to do? I want you to apply. Apply and multiply. I want you to apply what I taught you, and then I want you to multiply it by giving it to others. That's who I am. That's what I do. And that's how I began to land the plane. So when you leave, you've heard the best message, but you feel the big message. Now, that's exactly what I want you to feel today also. I, I, I want you to, I, I want you to see your possibilities as a communicator. I want you to know that I value you and I know you can learn how to communicate. You have to practice it. You have to get the book, but you can learn how to communicate. And I want you to, I want you to know that I, I want you to absolutely feel empowered, empowered to go out and practice this. And, and as you do, I want you to see, I, I want you to see results. I want you to see people that take what you teach and they apply it, they multiply it in their life. Okay. I started the whole teaching today with you by saying, my name is John and I'm your friend. Well, I'd say that all the time. When I die, don't you think they'll put that on my tombstone? <laughs> His name is John and he's your friend because I, I am. But I just want to say as we wrap it up, my name's John and I'm your friend. I want to thank you for spending time with, with me and, 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 and with my audience today. Uh, I, I've just shared a, a very small fraction of really what's in the book on the 16 laws. And I hope that you've heard enough that inspires you to get started. But I hope that I have also shared with you that there's so much more that if you'll just buy the book, it will literally change the way you connect and communicate with people. And I'm very excited about that. And if you learn and you apply the laws of communication, you'll make the very most of your message and uh, it will help you to succeed in everything that you do in life. And, and remember one more thing. Well, two things. Buy the book. And number two, my name is John and I'm your friend. Thank you very much. <laughs>